As we open God's word together, let's ask him to bless it to us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, the unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. We open our mouths and pant because we long for your commandments. We ask you would turn to us and be gracious to us as is your way with those who love your name. Make your face shine upon your servants and teach us your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in God's word to uh, 1 Thessalonians 1. 1 Thessalonians 1. Um, And once you've found that, if you would put your finger there and turn back to uh, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. We're going to read the first uh, nine verses of Acts chapter 17 by way of introduction. Uh, That's the story of when the gospel first came to Thessalonica. And then we're going to uh, go to 1 Thessalonians and consider that word together. So I'm hoping to... Uh, for us to begin a new series on the books of First and Second Thessalonians. And so we want to get the background of that missionary journey, that second missionary journey of Paul that brought him to Thessalonica. And so Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 1, and let's pay careful attention for this is God's own word. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And then we read that Paul and Silas went from there to Berea by night. Let's turn over now to uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians, beginning chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 1 together. So I'll give you some time to turn there so you don't miss it. Um, it's a short verse, but an important one for us. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Thus far the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. Um, probably most of us spend very little time thinking about the beginning of emails or letters. Um, We quickly read past that opening introduction and get to the meat of whatever uh, comes. But we know that greetings are important. Um, You know, you you do have to think differently how you address different letters uh, to different people. And you know something of what the letter coming to you is going to contain by the greeting it gives. Um, Maybe if you're old enough like me to remember back in school when you're taught how to address letters... Uh, You were taught that if it was a personal letter, you would say, dear so-and-so, comma, and then you would write the letter. And if it was a formal letter, a business letter, you would write, dear so-and-so, colon. Um, And maybe some of you lost marks on your papers for forgetting the difference. Um, We know that difference. You also know the difference when you get a letter or an email. If I get a letter that says, dear William or dear Bill, I know something about the person that sends it to me. Um, If it says, dear resident... Uh, Dear Voter, Um, you know that it's something different. It's not quite so personal. It's of more a general nature. So while we don't spend much time with greetings, greetings are important. They do tell us something about what's coming later. And that's certainly true of the letters that are in the New Testament. Uh, Much of the New Testament is formed by way of letters. Um, And the greetings in those letters being not just letters to churches or to individuals, but letters in general coming from God to his people, the greetings are very important. 
the greetings tell us something about the content of the letters that we're about to read. And so we never want to be passing over the greetings. Um, now there are times to take the greetings with bigger chunks of Scripture. Uh, you can always take Scripture in smaller and smaller pieces. Um, I remember a preaching professor in seminary saying, you have to make those decisions. I mean, you can come to the word grace in the Scriptures and say, brothers and sisters, what is grace? And you could spend the whole service on that. And then you come to peace and you could say, brothers and sisters, what is peace? And you could spend the whole time talking about that. So there's a time where we can consider it with broader messages of Scripture. But there are also times, I think, to consider them in their own right, to think about those greetings that come to God's people from their God. And to think about the significance of those greetings. And this greeting here, I think, tells us something of the contents of the letter that will follow. A letter that's written to a church that is badly in need of comfort and reassurance. This is a good church. This is a church about which Paul has heard a good report. Now, like any church, there are going to be things he's going to need to address, that he's going to need to correct. There's no such thing as a perfect church. But this is a good church. Uh, Paul's writing to them with encouragement, to give them encouragement as he finds them in need of comfort and reassurance. And so in many ways, the beginning of this letter is a beginning of his comfort and assurance coming to God's people. Um, And we shouldn't miss how this word of of comfort and assurance that comes to God's people here um, introduces the whole content of the letter, sets it off on the footing that Paul intends for it to be a comfort and to be an encouragement to the people of God. And just as the Thessalonians were a people in need of comfort and encouragement, so we often find ourselves as God's people in need of comfort and encouragement. And so we know that God's word works wonderfully and that it's not just a word for this people in that place long ago, but it's a word for this people here today, here and now, to bring us comfort and assurance in the midst of all we go through in this world. And so as we think about the importance of this word, as we think about the importance of this comfort and assurance that it brings to God's people, we want to think about this greeting. We want to think about this greeting for our comfort as it comes first through gospel ministers to a grounded church from a gracious God. That's how we want to think about this greeting this morning. You can still draw three points out of just one verse. It can be done, and then we're going to try to do it uh, this morning. Uh, this, This greeting comes from gospel ministers, through gospel ministers, to a grounded church from their gracious God. Um, And in all of that, it's very important. This greeting comes through gospel ministers. Um, We notice the first thing we read there is the identity of the people who are sending this letter. Um, And these are three gospel ministers who are known by the church in Thessalonica. The, The authors of the letter here come at the beginning. Um, Now, that's different the way we write letters, boys and girls. We always put the the person who sent the letter at the end. Um, You read, sincerely, so-and-so. Then you know who the letter is from. Um, They helped us out by putting who it was from at the beginning. And that's where we we know this letter comes from Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. Um, It identifies these men as the same men who came and preached to them in Acts 17. Uh, So these were gospel ministers who had come to them and who had preached the gospel to them. Um, Now, we can be a little confused by that name Silvanus because that's what Silas' name is in in Latin. Um, So Silas is his Greek name that Luke uses as he writes in Greek, but Paul often speaks of him as Silvanus, which is just his Roman name. So don't be confused. It's the same person. It's Silas, the Silas who went with Paul on his second missionary journey. And so these are all three men who were known to them. Um, And Paul often writes about these men. Um, They are all gospel preachers. That's how they came to the church. Um, We can think of 2 Corinthians 1.19. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. Um, They were all preachers. Paul said, I preach Christ, 
Silvanus preached Christ, Silas preached Christ, Timothy preached Christ. We all preach Christ to you. And even though they're all gospel ministers, we know that they all have different functions in the New Testament. Paul was an apostle, and we know him well from the scriptures. Um, but sometimes scripture tells us something by what it doesn't say. I want to meditate on that while I took a drink of water. Sometimes scripture tells us something by what it doesn't say. Notice what Paul does not say about himself in this greeting. He does not say, Paul, an apostle. They might say, thank you for that factoid. Why is that important? This is only one of two letters in the whole New Testament where Paul does not identify himself as an apostle. Almost every other time, Paul identifies himself as an apostle, and one of the reasons he does that is to establish his authority before the church, um, especially when he needs to say hard things to the church. Um, he, he's particularly clear about his apostleship when he writes to the Galatians. Uh, because in a lot of ways, he has to begin that letter by saying to them, Grace, mercy, and peace to you from Paul, an apostle, by the will of God. What's wrong with you people? Um, if you're going to say that, you better establish your authority right out of the gate. Um, and so the fact that he doesn't do that here tells us something about the nature of this letter. It tells us that he doesn't need to establish his apostleship to this church. That he knows that they will take his authority and his ministry as a given. And the only other church that he does this with is the Philippian church. The churches of Macedonia were known for their love and their service to Christ. And they're the only churches that Paul doesn't need to come to and say, Paul, an apostle. Because he doesn't need to establish his authority with them. Because he knows that they've received his authority, that they've listened to him, um, that they come to him uh, with a manner of respect and obedience. He can write to them as a friend without needing to assert his authority. So this letter comes from Paul, an apostle. It comes from Silas. Uh, we know that Silas went with Paul in his second missionary journey. Acts 15 tells us that he was a leading man of the church in Jerusalem and that he himself was a prophet. Um, one, of the, one of the helpful things about Silas, especially as he comes to uh, these different Jewish synagogues where Paul goes, is that he is a Jewish Christian. He's from Jerusalem. He's from the heart and the center of Jewish Christianity. Um, and he can be a particular help to Paul in this ministry. And, of course, finally we come to Timothy, who was Paul's special assistant and emissary to the churches. Uh, when Paul wasn't able to go somewhere, he sent Timothy. Uh, that shows us something of how important Paul thought of Timothy being for the ministry of the church. And maybe we don't think about Timothy as being one of the most important figures in the New Testament, um, but he appears in almost every single book of the New Testament. Almost every single letter um, that comes, if we think about them, uh, Timothy is mentioned in all of Paul's letters. Um, the only two being exempted, accepted are Galatians and Ephesians. But he's also in the book of Hebrews, and two of the letters of the New Testament are written to him. Um, and so he's a very important figure, a disciple of Christ from Lystra, who was, had a Greek father and a Jewish mother, who was also chosen to accompany Paul on his second missionary journey. We see, too, why he would be helpful in coming to synagogues like we read in Acts 17 that were filled with Jews and devout Greeks. Um, Timothy is both Jewish and Greek. Um, he can relate to both, both of those aspects of the church. And so God has prepared these men and sent these men to preach the gospel. They preach the gospel to Thessalonica, and these three men are the men under whom most of this church were converted to the gospel. Not only are these the men who preach the gospel to them, but these are the men who came to the synagogue and showed us what was the custom of their ministry. To come to the synagogue, to come to people who knew the Old Testament, to take them through the Old Testament, 
to say that the Old Testament said that Christ would have to suffer. The Old Testament said the Christ would have to rise again from the dead. The prophets were talking about the Christ to come, and Jesus who came into the world is the promised Christ. He's the promised Messiah. That's how they preached to them, and many of them in Thessalonica had heard this word and believed, both Jews and devout Greeks. Greeks who had believed in the Jewish religion but had not been circumcised. Um, they came to believe in the gospel, and not a few of the leading women of the synagogue were all persuaded to follow. That's who makes up this church. And so this greeting is coming to believers. Coming to believers who've been converted under these men's ministries. These are gospel ministers who they know, who they love, who they are children of in the Lord. And they come and they speak to them as gospel ministers. And they speak to them these words of greeting as a grounded church. Um, as we read these words, and if we don't know much about the church in Thessalonica, we might think that these words come to a church that is well grounded, that's well established, that's long existed. I don't know how you think about the church in Thessalonica as you hear about these words of greeting coming to them. But they're actually a very recent church. Um, we don't have time to get into all the, the whys and the wherefores, but this letter was likely written to them only a few weeks after the church had started, at the most a few months after the church had started. Uh, and that too should affect how we think about this word coming to the church. Um, maybe you remember when you first came to Christ um, and things were new um, and you had to figure things out. And, and the same is true of this church. It's filled with new believers. People who've been converted from Judaism. People who've been converted from paganism. Uh, all kinds of different former experiences that are now being radically changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whole new understandings that they have to come and grapple with. Right? There's a whole new morality that some of them have to learn. Practices that they used to engage in that they can't engage in anymore. They have to learn a whole new way of life. Um, and if you've ever ministered to, you know, and tried to shepherd and disciple new believers, that's one of the things they can really struggle with, is how to live in this new morality, how to, how to understand how to live life in the way that God has called us to live it. Uh, they're going to have to renounce some of their pagan ways, and Paul's going to have to address some of those things again, particularly sexual immorality. They're struggling with a new morality. They're struggling with a new perspective. Right? Imagine being a, a, a Jewish believer and always thinking to yourself, the Messiah will come one day. And then one day someone comes up to the synagogue and tells you, you know what? The Messiah has already come. Um, those times of restoration and relief that you were hoping for, we're living in now. You don't have to wait anymore. He's here. He's alive. He's ministering to his church in heaven. Um, that would radically change your perspective. And these Christians are going to struggle with that new perspective. If these are the times of the Messiah, if these are the times of relief and restoration, how do we live? Because the Old Testament said that the end must be coming soon. If the end is, is coming soon, how do we live? Do we labor for the things that are about to pass away? How, how do we think about this world? How do we live in this world? They're going to have to readdress that. Paul's going to address those things as well. To think of the Messiah coming into the world. And they're struggling with the fact that everybody is new. Um, if you've ever served in, in church office and, and were a new office bearer, you had to learn, how, how do I do this? What, what is involved? What, what, what am I supposed to do? Um, and that, that's hard enough when you're surrounded by people who know what they're doing. Uh, but imagine these council meetings, these consistory meetings, where they're all brand new. They're all new to the faith. They're all new to the church. They're all new to Jesus Christ. Most of them have never served in church office before. They're all trying to figure it out. How do we do this? So a new morality, a new perspective, a new leadership, all of these things are going to be addressed by Paul, And in addition to being new and relatively young in the faith, they're being fiercely persecuted. We read from Acts 17, this church started with persecution. They weren't three Sabbaths in before they were being persecuted by the world. 
um, by the rest of the Jewish synagogue that hated them and was harassing them out of the church. These ministers were chased out of the town and had to go to out of the way Berea by night. You know, this is a church that didn't begin without its share of persecution, and that persecution has continued. People continue to harass the church, um, continue to question Paul's ministry in his absence, acting as if he was just there to profit off of them, and Paul's going to have to defend his ministry as this letter goes on. It would have been very easy for this church to think of themselves in a very shaky and a very precarious position. But Paul's greeting that comes from him and from these other ministers regards them as a grounded church. Doesn't ever speak to them as if their very existence is in question. Never speaks to them as if their survival is an open question. He addresses them as a grounded church. And a church that is grounded because they are grounded in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he can speak of them as a grounded church. Not on a shaky foundation, but built on the solid rock of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and every one of these words has significance in the greeting. And we're going to go through, we have the time to look at each of these words. They are a church. They are a church. They are the called out ones of God who've been called out from this world to be his people. And those with an Old Testament background would have understood the significance of that calling out. That they are a people who have been called out from the rest of the world to serve their God, to be his gathered congregation, to be his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples in the world, they are the ones he has called out of this world to belong to him. But that's what the church is, the gathered congregation of our God. So regardless of how the world thought about them and their circumstances and their identity in the world, this is how God wants them to regard themselves. As those who have been called out from the world to belong to him, that he has chosen as his own precious and treasured possession. That is significant. It's no small thing for God to call you his church. His called out ones. That's what they were. That's what we are. We are those that God has called out of the world to belong to him, to be treasured by him, to be cared for by him. That is no small thing. It's no small thing for God to call us his church. And to call us his church in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a church that belongs to the Almighty God who is our Father for Christ's sake. That this God who has all power and all authority has brought us into his family, who loves us as a father. And who loved us so much that he sent to us the Lord Jesus Christ. Every single one of those words is also significant. He's the Lord. He's the covenant God. He's Jesus who came to save his people from their sins. He is the Christ. The one who's been anointed by the Father in the Holy Spirit to be our prophet, priest, and king. That's who they are. That's who we are. They are the church in that God. That's what makes the church grounded. That's what makes the church indestructible. That's what makes God's people standing on a solid rock in the midst of a world that feels like it is ever shifting. Why? Because we are in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Jesus said during his earthly ministry, if you are in me, no one will snatch you out of my hands. And if you're in my Father, no one can snatch you out of his hands because my Father is greater than all. And I and my Father are one. 
It doesn't matter if the whole city is stirred up against this church. It doesn't matter if they face constant opposition. It doesn't matter if they are new or their leaders are new. They are grounded. They are grounded in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that makes them indestructible. That is a reality that nothing in this world can change. Nothing in this world can shake. Nothing in this world can tear down. This reality will survive the ages. This reality will survive this world. This reality will survive death. This reality will survive all. When everything else passes away, God's people will be in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a glorious thought? Isn't that a comforting assurance? Doesn't a church in a shaky position in this world need to be reminded of that reality? It would be a comfort to them to hear this from their gospel ministers in the midst of their circumstances, and it should be a comfort to us too. Because we don't face exactly the same, you know, challenges that they faced in Thessalonica all those years ago, but the church in this world sure faces challenges. And we can feel like the world is shaking And that the very ground underneath our feet that we've known and trusted is shifting. And we can be tempted to think that when the world shakes and its foundations, that we're going to fall. But we embrace the reality that God's word teaches us. That actually we are on solid ground. And that when the earth shakes and all its foundations, it's God who holds steady its pillars. And that if we are in the God, the Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are, then no one can snatch us out of their hands. That he will preserve us as he builds his church and gathers his elect in the world. And when the number of the church is complete, he will come again in glory and bring us relief and restoration. But the church that's in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ has nothing to fear from this world. And we have to go forward with that confidence, not in ourselves or in our circumstances, but in our God and in his Christ. And that's why we need to understand this greeting comes not just through gospel ministers to a grounded church, but from a gracious God. We've spent all this time talking about and around the greeting, but we haven't actually touched on the greeting. Maybe you thought I'd forgotten. I didn't. Um, What is the greeting that comes from their gracious God with all of these realities that we've discussed? Grace to you and peace. Grace to you and peace. They want them to understand that this is God's word to them. It might come through those ministers, but it is not their word. It's God's word. It's God's promise. It's God's reality for those who cling to Christ by faith. Ministers wish these things for their people. Don't get them wrong. They all wanted for the Thessalonian church what every minister wants for his church. Every minister wants his people to experience grace and peace from God. That is what we labor for. That is what we pray for. That is what we preach for. That you would know the grace of God and you might have peace in the Lord Jesus Christ by believing in his name. We wish it. We work for it. We pray for it. We hope for it. We can't make it a reality. But when this word comes, it's not the wish of a minister. It's the sure word of God. Because God does have the power to shed forth his grace. God does have the power to grant his people peace. And he speaks that living word through his ambassadors, but it's a word from heaven to those who have believed in Jesus Christ. You have grace and peace. That is the word of the living God, not just to this, to this church in Thessalonica, but to us. We have grace from God and peace. And God showers that grace on his people in so many different ways. 
This is a people that have already experienced the saving grace of God. This is a people that is currently experiencing the sanctifying grace of God, where he's conforming them more and more to the image of his son. They're experiencing the, the sustaining grace of God in the midst of persecution that they might not lose their faith and stumble and fall. This is a church that knows the grace of God. And this greeting is a reminder that our God comes to us and says to us, there is grace sufficient for everything that you need. And if you ever find yourself saying, I need more grace, there is a God in heaven who says, then you may have it. No matter how much grace we need, our God is there to provide it to us. No matter what befalls us in this world, His grace is sufficient for us. It's sufficient when we are out of resources. When we are out of an ability to deal with the circumstances of life, there is grace sufficient from our God. Saving grace, sanctifying grace, sustaining grace. And a reminder that the chief blessing that this grace bestows on us is to know that we have peace with God. Because for all of us, there will be a time where nothing but that matters. There's a lot of things we get concerned about in this world. But at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is the, is the answer to the question, do you have peace with God? Because that is the one reality that I can say with confidence we will all have to reckon with. There's many things that some of us won't struggle with in this world our unique challenges, our unique little different things that we, we wrestle with and struggle with. But here's the guarantee that we all have to face. Do you have peace with God? When you meet Him, when you stand before the judgment seat of God, will you stand before without fear because you have peace with Him through Jesus Christ and what He's done? Or will you try to cover yourself in some other kind of fig leaf that won't cover you? And what God does to this people is he comes and doesn't leave it an open question. He says, you've believed in Jesus Christ. Know that the word from heaven to you is that you have peace with God. These are not just nice things we say to begin a service. They are crucial words that we need to hear from the living God. Know that you who believe in my name have grace, all that you need, and that you have peace with me. I come to you as a God who is not angry with you, but is at peace with you through Jesus Christ. That is a tremendous present assurance. To know that we have God's grace, to know that we have God's peace, it also gives us wonderful hope for the future. That to all the different kinds of grace that God sheds on us in this life, that one day he will come and add to those graces the grace we long for, the glorifying grace of God. The grace that will perfect us after the image of Jesus Christ. The grace that will bring us to rest in the heaven of our God. Grace now and the grace that we long for in the age to come and peace with God now, and perfect peace in the world to come. Because peace with God in this life doesn't mean you don't face trials. The Thessalonian church is a testimony to that. Having peace with God doesn't give you peace in all other aspects of life yet. But that day is coming. When God will give us a permanent and perfect peace, and the peace of Christ will fill the new heavens, and the new earth. It's a wonderful hope for the future. And the last thing that we need to know about that grace and that peace is it's spoken to you. It's one thing to speak that word generally to the church. It's another thing that God sends his word and sends his ministers, sends his ambassadors from heaven to say, I want you to make sure that each and every one of them who believe in my name understand they have my grace 
and they have peace with me. It's not just grace and peace here, is it? It's grace to you and peace. The Lord Jesus speaks that word to every one of us. So that we know that it's not just a general truth, but it's a personal and individual truth. And that's why he wants his ministers to bring that word. To begin the service with that word to God's people of grace and peace. So they're reminded once again in this world that threatens in so many ways to distract us from these truths. That this is the sure word that God has spoken to each and every one who believes in the name of Jesus Christ. Because there's much in this world that tries to rob us of that sense, distract us from that reality, and try to alienate that from our hearts and our minds. We're almost done, but listen to to this word from a commentator. The world imposes itself on us. We are distracted by our work. All kinds of conversation and news reports distract us. We are captivated and kept busy by what we see. And this creates such a serious separation between our souls and God that often, when, even when we pray, when we open our eyes, our souls have not really been with God for one single moment, nor experienced God's holy presence. Many people who often go to church would have to confess in all honesty after arriving back home that they had not felt the presence of God. There is no awareness of having attended an audience with the King of Kings. This world is always threatening to distract us. And that was written over 100 years ago. Um, So it was true in this commentator's day. It's true in our day. There's so much that tries to separate us from the reality in which we live. That's why it's such a precious truth that God comes and gathers us together as his called out church, reminds us that we are in the Father and in his Son, and speaks that word that we need to hear from his throne of grace. You have grace, and you have peace with me. We need that as a crucial counterbalance to the world that would distract us and alienate us. Our God lives Our God speaks to us, and he speaks to us that word of blessing. What a comfort it must have been for the church in Thessalonica to receive that word. What a comfort it should be to us to hear those words from God's throne of grace and to know that we are the called out ones of God, grounded in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that he comes to each and every one of us and says, grace to you and peace, both now and forevermore. Thanks be to God for the inexpressible gift of Jesus Christ and the blessing that comes to those who love him and long for his appearing. And all God's people said, amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we confess that so we hear those words of grace and peace so often that we don't meditate on them enough to know that we have grace from you for all that we need and peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ. And may we go away from here conscious that we have had an audience with the King of Kings and that you have spoken that sure word to us. Might we take that word forward with us into the week ahead, into the world that so often tries to distract us and alienate us from that truth. And may we cling to that sure reality that we've been called out of this world, that we are safe in you, our Father, and in Jesus Christ, our Lord, whom you've sent, that we will be kept by you against all that afflicts us in this world, even in the face of death, that we will be gathered into your presence and experience the end of your grace, which is glory and the end of that peace which is unbroken fellowship and joy with you, the one true God in heaven. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who continues to live and speak this word to your people. For Jesus who continues to minister on our behalf at your throne of grace. And to you, our Father, who has loved us with an everlasting love. Hear our prayers, we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen.